I owe you an apology. I'm sorry. I'm getting it out of the way up front. What is it I'm apologizing for? Well, several things. My, my video titles uh, never match the video. I'm addressing the complaint department here. Uh, my stories are super long-winded, and I go all over the place before I ever get to the point. If I ever even get there, most folks give up. Um, Okay, I have water today instead of coffee. No need to apologize for that. Um, so I'm sorry. There. So at least this time, the title of the video has something to do with the actual video. Okay? Even though it has nothing to do with the story. The story has to do with ghosts, a curse, spoiled children, and a wonderful little old lady who's no longer with us named Ellen, who is of Irish descent, though she was born and raised in Maine. Uh, I remember this story because of a story I told a couple of days ago where I talked about the Irish immigrants that had opened up a coal mine in Appalachistan, caved in, killed everybody, and then the, the, the gravesite became haunted. I had completely forgotten about this story until I told that one. And I was like, man, I got to tell the people about this one. So I knew this eccentric little old lady. She was in her 80s when I knew her. This was about 20 years ago. Uh, I spent the first eight years of my adult life after college being a stockbroker, financial planner, investment representative, whatever you want to call it. I was a salesman. Okay, I was a door to door salesman. I sold stocks, bonds and mutual funds. And, and occasionally I would deal with annuities. I didn't like those because they're a very expensive product. Um, you can usually just do the same thing with mutual funds, but there's this retirement plan called a 403B. Teachers have them, people that work at hospitals. So I do a lot of 403B transfers and those happen to be annuity. Uh, whatever, this isn't about investing. This is about a little old lady named Ellen that I met through investing. She was referred to me by another client of mine and, uh, she had retired, uh, and like so many folks who are from the Northeast, she, she came south in retirement. She couldn't stand the cold in her older ages like she could in her youth. And she relocated down here to Central Virginia. Now, it took me a little while to get Ellen's account, uh, not because she was a hard nut to crack, but because I would go see her at her home. This is... You know, I called her upon a referral. She asked me to her home. I went to talk to her. That whole first time we got together, we never even talked about her money. Uh, she was so likable, so folksy, down to earth. Uh, she, she's a perfect fit for Virginia. I mean, you'd think she was from down here. Uh, it took, and this is why my bosses at that investment firm hated me. They said I talked too much. Gee, maybe I should apologize to them too. Ah, whatever. Water over the dam. Um, I enjoyed talking to her, and she was eccentric in that she collected phone books. She had this, she showed me around her house. Um, she lived alone. Her husband had been dead for many years. She had two adult children. They're part of the story. Trust me. Uh, they, they would be baby boomers. They would have been in their 50s at the time. They're probably in their late 70s now. Uh, if they're still alive. Um, but she had one room, even though she lived alone, she had like a 4,000 square foot home because she had a lot of money. But she had one room filled with telephone books that she kept from different places she'd lived going back to childhood. She had telephone books from like the 1920s or however early, the earliest phone books were made. She was there. <sighs> Not really part of the story, but again, I already told you I was sorry. So we finally got around to talking about her money. And she said, well, I have one account, I guess I could maybe give to you because this broker is still up in Maine and I haven't heard from him in a couple of years. This was when the market was in a downturn. After the dot-com craze, all those bubbles had burst, a lot of brokers were hiding from the clients. I had picked up a lot of new business back then because I would simply go out and talk to people. People weren't blaming their brokers. They just wanted to know what was going on. I just stayed in touch with everybody and, and it benefited me. 
um, being that they had somebody to talk to, got a lot of new accounts, kept the ones I already had because I'd call my client, the clients, and they'd say, you know, looks like we're down another 50 grand this quarter. And I'd be like, yeah, sorry. Because, I mean, that was more money than I made in a year at the time. I'd tell them that. I'd say, I couldn't imagine being down that much. And then they'd laugh and they'd cheer me up because, again, this was a World War II generation. Without doubt, like Tom Brokaw said, the greatest generation ever. These folks had work ethic. They were honest. They had grit. If, by God, they had to get out and dig a ditch to feed their families, that's what they did. They didn't view it as if they were too good to do work that got their hands dirty. Uh, wonderful people. Wonderful people. So, uh, this account Ellen had was worth more than a million dollars. Valued more than maybe 1.2 million, something like that, which at the time was like huge for, that's huge today. That's a lot of money. Okay. So she told me when we were finally talking about her account, she showed me her statement. She goes, uh, what would you do if I transferred this account to you? I looked at it. And here's another reason my bosses hated me, okay? And I'm not, I've am not i not named the firm I work for. I never have and I never will. I'm not giving them any free advertisement on my channel. But uh, I was one of those guys, I'd look at the account, and in her case, she had large blue chip dividend paying stocks that were very conservative in nature as far as stocks goes. Uh, they paid consistent dividends her broker had her diversified to where even though the stocks she owned paid quarterly dividends she had enough of them to where she was getting checks every month and i said to her i said i wouldn't recommend changing really anything because it looks like you're where you need to be i said and she had a bunch of cash built up i asked her about that she said that cash was basically from the dividends they weren't being reinvested to buy more shares because she said you know i'm rich enough uh I just let that pile up in cash, and as long as I can keep my kids from finding out I have it, I like to reinvest that about once a year or so. What should I do with that? And it was maybe 50 grand or so, and I recommended tax-free municipal bonds uh, so she could continue to receive income from her investments, but this would be federally tax-free, state tax-free. It was insured, stable, safe. She said, I like that idea. She goes, my son's coming in from Copenhagen, I guess, what is that, the capital of Denmark? My friends from Europe, and when I lived in the Philippines, I had so many friends from Europe who used to make fun of me because they were like, you don't even know anything about European geography. But I think Copenhagen's the capital of Denmark, isn't it? Correct me if I'm wrong. So, uh, her son lived there, he was coming in soon and she wanted us to sit down with him because she liked to make him feel as if he was important like to let him have a say in some of the stuff she did and she wanted me to talk to him and she wanted to see me interact with him i was like hey okay not a problem and that was common back then because a lot of these world war ii folks they wanted to make sure they weren't being taken advantage of uh some you know when we age our minds slip a little bit uh we become forgetful and it's not that we're forgetful so much as it is is there's just so much up there to remember you know because we've lived so long you get it if, if you're watching 70 percent of you're older than me so her son comes in we meet we get together and he's just looking down his nose at me uh asking me about my education i told him yeah i've got a bachelor's and it's called a board of regents degree bachelor's in nothing or he thought i should have a finance degree he asked me what my when I was going to get my MBA, I said, well, I'm probably not. I'm not, definitely not. And he's like, well, why not? I'm like, because I have a wife and three kids. That was my first marriage. I said, I don't have the luxury of being one of these lifelong adult college students who lives off of grant money in pursuit of the ever relentless three or four PhDs or EDDs or whatever. I said, I got to work. I got to take care of, you know, my family. And well, that was just trashy you know and his just looking down and his mom was there i was saying this stuff to him i mean i am who i am you know love me or hate me i don't try to be somebody i'm not and his mom's over there smirking i'm like well this isn't going well this guy he doesn't like me he's you know high fluting so we wrap things up they tell me goodbye i leave she calls me a couple days later and said hey what do i need to do to transfer this account to you 
And I said, well, I thought your son hated me. I kind of got the impression he didn't like me. And she goes, well, he didn't. That's why I know I should use you. She said, let me tell you something. The only thing my son knows about money is how to spend mine and how to spend the money of any woman that will take him in to keep him from having to work on his own and earn his own. And uh, she said, I love how you just kind of stood up to him. And, you know, I didn't put him in his place. I just didn't let him put me in mine, I guess, because I know mine and I'm comfortable in it. So she transferred the account to me. So I got to know her quite well over time. And uh, I found out she had another child. She had a daughter. I was like, well, what's she like? And she says, well, she lives right over there across the road from me. She's just waiting on me to die. She's a lot like her brother. Um, I was like, wow. Uh, somehow the conversation came around to her daughter's wedding and how basically her daughter did something that broke generational protocol and the old woman ellen told me that her daughter would understand how dear that was in the end and of course this just piqued your curiosity as it did mine at the time i said well can you share with me this protocol and she said yep she goes i never told you how i got my money did i and i said well no and she goes i got it the old-fashioned way and i said oh you worked for it she goes no i inherited it I was like, okay she explained to me that her ancestry was irish and i want to give a shout out to all our friends in ireland i didn't realize we had so many of them until i told that story the other day about how badly the irish immigrants were treated here in the mid 1800s through the early 1900s and even later um so, hey, shout out to our Irish viewers. And, and so many people here have commented they're of Irish descent. So anyway, Ellen's, not her mother, not her grandmother, but I guess her great-grandmother, her father owned a lumber mill in Maine. I forget the name of the community, but it was on a river called the Penobscot River. Now, I remember that because when she told me the story and she described the area, it sounded so beautiful. I'd always wanted to go fishing, fly fishing in Maine. It was always a dream of mine. And a few years after I met Ellen, I did. And I went fly fishing on the Penobscot River. I can't remember the place. And that river just winds around everywhere and it opens up into these beautiful finger lakes. Absolutely gorgeous. Those of you who live up there, you live in a truly beautiful area. If you've not seen it, you've got to make a trip to Maine and see this place. My vision was just averted by a bumblebee about this big. The bees are out now. I'm hoping that the honeybees come out and get into my bee traps. I've grown impatient. I've actually bought some honeybees. I'm going to be picking them up here in about two weeks because I want to make sure our fruit orchards and everything get pollinated properly this year. So anyway... Dean the rooster. You can hear him down there. So here's the deal. Uh, the great grandfather was not of Irish descent, okay, that owned the lumber mill, okay? Uh, but it was her great grandfather on the mother's side that was of Irish descent. Here's the deal. Uh, this was during the time late 1800s when it was very hard for Irish immigrants or Irish descendants to find work, to receive fair treatment, to not be discriminated against. Uh, but this gentleman, this Irish gentleman, and we're going back to like the 1860s, right around the time of the Civil War, he got a job at this lumber mill and he was part of the team that would uh, help run the logs down the river from where they timbered them in the forest. They'd pile them up in the rivers as they cut the trees down, drag them with horses down, throw them in the rivers all spring, all summer, all fall. Winter would come, snow and ice, and the following spring when all that stuff melted, it would just cause these floods that would take the logs down river to the lumber mills where they could saw them up and turn them into lumber. So, this Irishman fell in love with the daughter of the man that owned the lumber mill. And they had made secret plans to elope 
because this young woman's father would have nothing to do with her marrying an Irishman. So she was going to run away and get married to this Irishman. She had the dress, had the beautiful veil, everything. Plans were made. Well, the old man found out about these plans and he was going to have nothing to do with it. So his crew, as it turned out, was getting ready to make a log drive down the river. The floodwaters were up, the logs were coming in. So he arranged for this Irishman and two uh, not so good guys working for him who were not Irishmen to go on this run together. And those two guys, those two strong men were instructed to ensure that the Irishman did not survive this log run. Now, it was very dangerous work uh, I had a great grandfather on one side of my family actually drowned doing this maybe a century ago back in Appalachistan. Very common. Uh, those guys, they would use these big poles to push the logs out of jams when they get jammed. I might have to sneeze. Get ready to excuse me. <coughs> the pollen and everything starting to come out. I tried to position the camera to where you can see these beautiful purple buds on these eastern redbud trees back here got him planted all over <laughs> just in time to find out I'm allergic to them but well, whatever they look nice <sighs> so anyway here's uh, the situation there where this man's lumber mill was situated and where it was on part of the river that opened up into what looked like a lake that's where they would collect the logs but this hole, it was called the log hole. It had a curse. And it wasn't called the log hole because this is where they collected the logs for the, the lumber mill. It was because of a log the size of a bus that had been, that had fallen uh, due to old age on the bank opposite of the mill and still like 40 or 50 years after it fell, stuck up out of the water from a giant sycamore tree that had a very dark past. This sycamore tree, which stood for centuries before it died, before it fell into the log hole, saw a lot of death. It saw many Native American Indians hanged there. It saw many uh, Sounded like a loud growl or a loud bark, but there are no dogs around here. A lot of death, okay? Uh, if truth were to be known and backwater secrets were to be uncovered, there were black people hanged from that tree, there were Irishmen hanged from that tree. There were uh, men who had messed with the wrong other men's wives hanged from that tree. It was just, it was a death tree, okay? The last known hanging of anyone by this tree, as the story goes, as Ellen told it to me, was a recently freed black man. He had been an enslaved person. He had gone north after... The Civil War, and, and this is a part of history that you're not going to hear in schools, and it's probably not going to be very popular for me to tell on social media. But uh, just because the northern states fought to end slavery doesn't mean that everybody in the north uh, was friendly with people of color. I think that's the safest way I can say it without violating any policies or guidelines or whatever. Um, mistreatment has taken place, did take place, and continues to take place everywhere. Okay? And we see enough of that nonsense out there to know that this is true. And it was true back then. Well, this man that was hanged from this tree happened to be a practitioner of black magic. 
and he cursed the land. It was his final act before he was hanged to death from that tree. He said, I curse all people of bad character, of bad nature, who mean ill will upon others who walk the banks of this river. And then he died by hanging. Everybody laughed. They thought it was a joke until people started drowning in this hole. People who were strong swimmers, but who, according to those who knew him, happened to be jerks. Kind of guy would go home after work and was in a bad mood, kick his dog. He would have, well, what I would call an unfortunate demise. That unfortunate demise being that he drowned in a log hole. Well, anytime somebody drowned in that log hole, of course, this would give credence to the, the curse or the legend of the curse. And it became known as a haunted place, a place of superstition, a place of urban legend. Well, that's where this sawmill was. That's where the logs were floated to. And that's where... The men were driving logs that fateful night. The next morning, two bodies were found. That of the strong-armed, not-so-good guys that were sent out to make sure that the Irishman didn't make it back. Well, he didn't make it back either, but they never found his body. And that day of course when his fiance found out about this she lost her mind and that night just as darkness fell her father and her mother happened to look out the window just in time to see that she was running across their property wearing her wedding dress wearing her veil and she was running to the river she was running to a place just above uh, this log hole where there was a series of falls they got to the to the hole, the water smoothed out, and then just below the hole, there was another series of falls. They chased after her, but they never found her. They went out screaming, and the next day, which would have been the day after, they recovered the bodies of the two men sent to kill the Irishman, and they still hadn't found the Irishman's body, but he never showed up, never showed up for work. No one around the camp saw him. They figured it would just be a matter of time before they found his body. But on that second day, the day after his fiance had gone running out across the property, they found her veil. They found it below the second set of falls, below that log hole. They never found her body either, and it was assumed that she threw herself into the river to drown herself so she could be with her true love in the afterlife. Ellen told me this story, and I asked her, well, whatever came of it and she said well you know that's part of the fun behind this veil and that's what upset me so much about my daughter not wearing my dress uh, when she got married the thing is they they never found the body of the Irishman they never found the body of the fiance and the reason they didn't is because the Irishman lived and so did the fiance and they went to a completely different part of the state where they were not known and they did get married and they did live happily ever after and after her father died the father that owned the lumber mill she did reconnect with her mother so they made their amends and the family was wealthy and that's where ellen's money came from all this money that's been passed down generation after generation i only got one of her accounts it was like 1.2 million she had other accounts out there with other people most of her stuff was tied up in trust that she couldn't even touch she just lived off the income from the trust okay but it was customary in her family the direct descendants of that line for the daughters to wear that wedding dress uh when they got married well her daughter didn't want to do it and she she said oh i don't want to hear those superstitious ghost stories the ghost story part of course being if the irishman survived was it him that killed the two guys that were supposed to kill him ellen said that to that man's dying day he swore that he never hurt those men he never 
uh, killed anybody, and it never even got to the point to where they tried to kill him. When they got close to that logging hole, they looked at him, and he could tell by the look in their eyes that they meant ill will. They had bad intentions, but they never laid a hand on him because just as they started to take a step across their logs to make their way toward him, more hands than he could count came up out of the water, grabbed both of these men by the legs, jerked them off the logs, and held them under until they drowned. The man claimed to have seen this with his own eyes. He knew the urban legends of the hole. He was convinced these were the ghosts or the spirits of those that had been hanged from the tree, the ropes cut for their bodies to just fall into the water. Because of that curse from the, the uh, man who was a practitioner of witchcraft or black magic who put that curse on that land, on that hole, the spirits could tell those men had ill intent in their heart, and they came up and they drowned those two men. The Irishmen, the Irishmen out of fear, ran away out of fear, being able to put two and two together, knowing it was his boss that set them up to do that because of the relationship he had with the boss's daughter. He fled, he went into hiding, but he did, this is the story behind the story, he did let the girl know the next day he was okay, he was alive, we've still got to elope, but you've got to make it look like, you know, a suicide. And so that's what she did. She threw her veil into the river, kept the dress, got married in it got the veil back after she had made amends with the mother years after she found out or the years later after she found out the father was dead okay and ellen you know so many of you say you love the way i tell stories you love a good story the people that i apologize to at the beginning of the video i think they just don't get good stories it, 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 you know, people say it's an art. I don't want to sit here and claim to be an artist. It's just it's something that I enjoy. I always enjoyed listening to good stories well told. Uh, I consider it an honor to be considered somebody who's maybe passing this type of thing down to the next generation because it, it really, if it, if it is an art, it's a lost art. I'm not an artist. But Ellen got it. So many of you who are still here watching this video this long into it get it. Ellen's daughter didn't get it. Uh, Ellen told me that her son and her daughter didn't really get a lot of things, work ethic. Um, they were spoiled. She told me they were spoiled. They had always had everything they'd ever needed without having to work for it because the family had means. But she told me that they would get it in the end. And, and she said it in like a creepy way, kind of like the end of a ghost story. Well... The day came when I found out that my friend Ellen, who she was a client, yeah, but a friend more than that, found out she passed away. And I found out the exact same way I found out so many of my World War II generation clients had passed away. I'd find out by their baby boomer children running into my office wanting to know how much mom and dad had in their brokerage account because they just couldn't wait to get it. It was really sad. That happened so many times. And when it would, I'd have to tell them, look, by law, I can't tell you anything about your parents' account. I need to have a death certificate before I can do anything. And that was the law. Uh, well, this made them mad. They would get upset and they would tell me, you know, when I get my this paperwork in order, I'm going to have you sell everything and send me a check because I'm not working with the likes of you telling me I need to prove my parents are dead with a death certificate. First time I heard that, it hurt my feelings. And I actually called one of my mentors, and he laughed. He said, well, listen, that's what they, they're always going to say that. And now here, I mean no offense towards baby boomers, and this is just kind of a, demo, this is a demographic thing. He said, those people are so far in debt, they need to sell everything mom and dad's got in their account just to try to hope they can break even. A lot of them will, and 18 months down the road, three years at the max, they're going to be so far in debt again, they're never going to get out because their FICO score is going to jump out. They're going to go out and borrow more money. They're going to remortgage the house if they do pay it off and blah, blah, blah. It's just whatever. The World War II generation was the most, they were the most fiscally responsible generation this nation's ever seen because they had to be. They lived through the Great Depression. They knew what it was like not to have you know, their needs met, and so they were tight. They were thrifty. Um, 
I had many of them sitting in my office admitting to me that they feel the biggest mistake they made was that they spoiled their baby boomer children. They didn't want their children to know the rough times they had, so they kind of gave them too much. They made things too easy, and then they saw once the baby boomers came of age that they'd kind of raised some monsters in that regard. That's their words. That's, you know, so I'm not trying to like insult an entire generation here. Um, so anyway, yeah, okay, whatever. Her daughter told me she's going to sell everything and blah, blah, blah. A couple weeks went by and I got a call from the home office. Said, hey, you got so-and-so's account. Yeah, she, she passed away a few weeks ago. He said, he said, okay, we've got a legal order here. You need to sell everything so that it settles into cash because we're going to be issuing a check. I was like, yeah, yeah, the daughter was in here a couple weeks ago and told me this was coming. So you want me to put sell orders in at market for all the stocks, sell the bonds, so you can send the daughter a check. And they said, well, yeah, but it, we're not sending the daughter a check. You need to liquidate, turn everything to cash, but it's not going to her. And I was like, oh, well, I guess it's going to the sun in Copenhagen. And they're like, no, it's not going to the sun in Copenhagen. I'm like, oh. Well, can you tell me where it's going? And they're like, well, I don't guess legally I can't. It's going to some 403C, which if you know anything about finance, that means a not-for-profit organization. So when Ellen passed on, I guess at least the portion of the money she had with me, I don't know about the rest. Now the trust, she couldn't touch. I'm sure her kids are still getting those trust funds, whatever. Uh, but the money that she had accumulated in her own name by saving, you know, her trust fund money and by working, uh, spending less than she made, uh, investing the difference and doing quite well over a period of her lifetime to enough to accumulate over a million dollars. That went to charity. So I guess maybe that's how her kids got it in the end. I used to wonder about that, you know, and again, I hadn't thought of this story in years, but I often wondered if the daughter had worn that wedding dress, might she had gotten some of that? I, I, I don't know, but that's, that's the story. I mean, maybe I owe you an apology for not having a better ending, but, you know, like Mark Twain said, uh, nonfiction, or no, fiction is harder to write than nonfiction because nonfiction, no, no, no. Nonfiction's harder to write than fiction because fiction has to at least make sense. So this is nonfiction because that ending doesn't make much sense. If you've sat through this nearly 33 minute long video and that ending upsets you, like the title says, I'm sorry.